tonight to this first event in our photo week at the Frontline Club. I really hope you'll come along to some of the other events in the week as well. Um, I'm just going to ask you please to switch off your mobile phones or turn them to silent so that we're not interrupted. And during the Q&A, for the benefit of our online audience, if you can speak directly into the microphone, that would be great. I'm just going to hand over to Alexia Singh. She is editor-in-chief of the wider Hard. picture. Hard. <laughs> Not chief. I'm going to say that clear. Editor-in-charge. Oh, oh editor-in-charge. Um, Slower, yeah. Pictures at Thompson's <laughs> Road. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's going to be I'll moderating be tonight. I'll be <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to introduce four exceptional photojournalists from the Agency 7 who are here to talk about the launch of their book, Questions Without Answers. So I'll just quickly introduce the panel. Um, we've got three founding members of Seven, Gary Knight, <laughs> John Stanmeyer, and um, Chris Morris. <laughs> and then also we've got Lindsay Adario, who um, joined um, the agency a year ago and Lindsay is going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like working for an agen agency like Seven and talk about some of the assignments that, that she's done recently and we'll see a slideshow of her work. Um, the book um, celebrates um, 20 years of recent history 
Um, it starts with the fall of the Berlin Wall and it goes chronologically through to the Arab Spring. And I think that the most interesting thing is just to dive in and get these photographers to talk <coughs> a little bit about some of the stories in the book. Um, so, yeah, let's start. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, two stories yes. stood out for me. Um, one, the bridge, this really sort of terrifying <coughs> blood, sweat and tears story, sort of real frontline photography from Iraq. And then a much quieter, more contemplative story from India. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got yourself in that situation in Iraq? And then yeah. maybe <coughs> go on to talk about the difference and, and what led you to do the India story. Well. Yeah, one begat the other, and you know, Iraq was a like a lot of uh, journalism. It was a bit of a mistake in a sense, in that um, I wasn't intending to be immersed. Um, I thought about being immersed inside a military unit. I'd gone through all sorts of different ideas before the war started. But you, know, uh, along with Christopher, I remember Chris and I um, were setting ourselves up at the same time. And we're operating out of Kuwait with Ron. We we're all discussing, you know, <coughs> how we were going to deal with this war. And right at the end, I decided I was going to be independent, drive across the border, do my own thing, drive around behind the troops, you know, follow them wherever they were going, but not be immersed inside uh, the unit. But on the first day, um, it was absolutely evident that, you know, I ran into a few Marines, asked them which way. The, the unit had gone, they told me they'd gone down this road, I went down the road and drove into an Iraqi <coughs> tank battalion. So it was really evident that, you know, the war wasn't going the way I anticipated. And I understood very quickly that if I wasn't immersed in a unit, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, be able to work, probably wouldn't survive. So I had to find a unit. So I ended up photographing the war in a way that I wasn't anticipating and I kind of got a lot more than I bargained for. Um, and. I think that story is, is the, it's, was that moment when I, I really grew a little tired of the violence and, um, and I started to think of ways to move away from, from that kind of photography, both, um, both in terms of working so viscerally with the media uh, and also you know, really losing, starting to lose interest in, in just being involved in that violence. So, India, um, what I've been doing in India uh, for the last few years is really just drifting around uh, with no a particular agenda um, and following my nose, literally following people down the street till I find somebody more interesting and then following them. Um, so uh, financing the trips by myself and really working in a, in a, in a much more fluid way in an environment um, which is much less <coughs> violent. Uh, and trying to immerse myself uh, amongst people, connect with them, enjoy the relationships, and, and really, you know, let it lead me wherever wherever it takes me. And John, you there's also two quite contrasting stories um, from you in the book. There's the kind of devastation of the tsunami that I know was particularly meaningful for you, having been based in Southeast Asia for 12 years and having lived in Indonesia. Um, and then also um, the food crisis, which was a much more long-term, in-depth study that has a lot of interesting things to say about um, the events that then came around a couple of years later in um, the Arab Spring. But first of all, could you talk a little bit about um, how you ended up covering the tsunami where you were and, and how it felt to be seeing this devastation happen to somewhere that was your home? Yeah, it, uh, it was Boxing Day of, of uh, 2004, uh, and I was standing in a rice field. I was living uh, in Bali, and I was with my children, and, uh, and I get a text message. And they, uh, it was from a colleague of mine uh, in Thailand, and saying, did you hear about this wave that, that washed up on Phuket? And no, you know, I'm out with my children. We just had Christmas, and, uh, and about five minutes later, the phone rings, and it's and it's Time Magazine saying a, a very large wave has hit Thailand, <coughs> uh, and they didn't quite know. We didn't. You know, information was very slow getting out, and uh, and at the time, Aceh 
there was a separatist war going on, and I'd been in Aceh many times, but you had to go in quite secretively, and, and military was everywhere. We didn't really know what was happening, but Thailand, because of its more infrastructure, information was coming out. Uh, so she said, you know, get on a plane. So I ran home, was on a plane by 9 o'clock or 5 o'clock in, in the evening, afternoon. And when I arrived in Bangkok, thinking, okay, well, now I need to get to Phuket, I turned on my phone and a text message arrived that said, go to Sri Lanka. That's all it said, was go to Sri Lanka. And, and through that time of flying, information started to come in. Of course, I was clueless because I'm at 3,500, 35,000 feet and no idea what's going on. And luckily, there was a Cathay Pacific uh, counter right next to me, the baggage claim. And I said, do you have any flights going to Colombo? And they said, yeah, in one hour. And I just threw my credit card on the table. And uh, make a long story short, I, I was on the, the coast of Trikomali uh, less than 24 hours after the tsunami hit in Sri Lanka. And it, it was just astonishing uh, to, to witness. I'd been a lot of natural disasters, a lot of, of course, conflicts. Um, but it, natural disasters play a different psychological uh, effect on me. Um, where in, in a conflict, there's usually somebody at fault, somebody's doing something wrong to someone else. But in a, in, in a natural disaster, there's no one to blame. Who are you going to blame? Are you going to blame God? Are you going to blame Allah? Are you going to blame Buddha? Uh, who are you going to blame? Uh, and it's just a calamity of, of on a scope that is just beyond human scale. And I actually ran into Gary there. Gary was working for Newsweek. I was working for Time. Uh, I spent about four or five days uh, in Sri Lanka. And then information started coming out about Aceh. Uh, and it was you know, astonishing what we were hearing. And Gary and I actually flew over to, uh, about a week later um, uh, to Aceh. And I was absolutely overwhelmed to, to witness what uh, a 30 meter, 100 foot wall of water that moves the speed of an aircraft, of an airplane, slamming into, into civilization. It was beyond photography. It was beyond a camera. It was beyond me. It, it was overwhelming. And, and then for the next almost two years, because this happened in, in the country that I, I was living in, yeah. owned a home. I wasn't just visiting, but we had deep roots there. My children are there. Uh, to this day, still affect me. And I've been back to Aceh five or six times and will probably go my whole life as a long-term project of how the earth heals itself as well as humans heal themselves. Uh, it, it, it's also a way of how I heal myself because of right issues that we work on. But that one was very, very, uh, to this day, impossible for me to, to grasp. And it was beyond a camera, beyond anything I could photograph. It's interesting because, Chris, we talked earlier about how uh, you've covered conflicts extensively for 20 years all over the world. And just following on from, from John's feeling of having something so devastating happening close to home, you covered Hurricane Katrina. And in fact, interestingly, you were with Bush at the time, I believe. Mm -hmm. we, I, I had left conflict photography to try to do something else, mainly because I had children. And uh, I started covering the White House. So I was assigned to the White House by Time Magazine. And it was, he was on his summer vacation in uh, Texas. So uh, we were actually, he made a trip out to <coughs> California the day the hurricane hit. And then we flew back to Washington. But we flew over uh, New Orleans. Air Force One came in real low at like 3,000 feet and flew over. So you had the bird's up. eye view. Yeah, and, and it's very rare for them to allow the, there's four photographers that travel on the Air Force One outside of the presidential photographer. And they, very rare, I had never had it happen with Bush that they brought all four photographers up front, but they brought us up front to take a picture of him looking out the window at, uh, which he later regretted because it had this, this view of because the well for the next 10 days or so the US government didn't do very much yeah. and uh, there was and this image of Bush looking out the window of flying over uh, New Orleans and uh, and then when we got back to Washington then I went to uh, then I went to uh, New Orleans yeah. and stayed around a month and uh, yeah it's 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 hard it's hard to see that you know you think in the West it's like here in the UK if there was a a major disaster. Let's say if there was a tsunami here or something, you know, it's like, how is the government going <coughs> to react? And to see uh, dead bodies left out on the streets for weeks at a time, and to see that in the States was uh, quite shocking, actually. And, uh, and, and you were sort of close to 
President Bush, not personally, but well, I spent I spent eight years covering him for time, and uh, over a time, over a time period, you kind of develop a relationship who you're covering this this one man for eight years, and uh, my views about him changed over the years. Um, From early, well, f early on, I did not like the man, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two thousand. Uh, you know, after September 11th and uh, up to the build-up to the war, and uh, I think he was really controlled. He, I, I think that the whole reason he was elected and uh, was put in there was because of, uh, they knew that they could control him. And I think after around 2006, last few years of his presidency, he realized that he had made some pretty major mistakes, and he start, was starting to fit into his shoes of being president and started to push Cheney away and these people. and try to regain some control of all the damage that was done. But uh, for me, it's fascinating to cover politics because you cover conflict all your life, and these are the, these are the people that, that actually carry it through. These are the people that make the decisions to send this whole cause and effect. And were you aware of that as you were taking pictures of him? Had you made that connection from, from the conflicts that you'd seen to, to being around these men? Yeah. I, I remember when I was covering conflicts with my colleagues, I used to say to people, I would never, there was actually two things I said I would never want to do. I'd never want to cover the White House and I would never want to do fashion photography. Self fulfilling <laughs> prophecy is very dangerous. I was like, why, <laughs> that, nothing's real about that, I thought. I, th I thought conflict photography was everything. To me, that was the ultimate in photography. Man trying to kill another man. It was this ultimate of evil in humanity and it was the hardest th thing to do photographically. And to me, these, these photographers that I saw that flew around on Air Force One and they thought they were so, I, I just, I never wanted to do that, to follow a man in a suit. And then the bit with fashion, it's because it's all, it's an illusion. It's kind of the opposite of what I felt I represented in my career because you're selling vanity, you're selling, uh, basically trying to sell a product that's not real. So that was, it's all this kind of weird conflict, but it's ironic that that's kind of what my path has taken. Just to go back to you, John, um, and, and the food crisis story that, that we mentioned, it was one that I found particularly fascinating because even within the few pages of the book, you can see that this was really a serious, in-depth <coughs> study. And I wondered whether you could foresee at that point that this was going to be very much something that sparked the events of the Arab Spring that came, what, almost two years later? Yeah, it, I think it sparked a lot of things that were happening and continue happening to this day uh, on our planet and among society of the fundamental uh, difficulty of, of survival, and that is just being able to afford food and being able to afford to eat. There, there are nearly two billion fellow human beings on our planet that survive on two dollars a day. And, 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 and an astonishing almost a billion and one dollar a day. And when 70% of your income of a dollar is going to feed yourself and your family and commodity prices rise 25, 35, 40%, you start getting into negative, uh, you can start going into hunger. And that is happening even to this day. Uh, and, and it dawned on me before writing this proposal one night, fiery in the middle of the night coming back from the US, uh, descent into the geographic that, that I had just been in the U.S. and I couldn't believe how expensive things were. And, and uh, you know, I, I kept going to my friends, how do you afford this? How do you afford to eat this? I also think, here, how do you afford to eat the kebab that I ate earlier today? I go, wow. You Don't know, eat I, it. I, no, but I'm just <laughs> saying, yeah, well, I probably should have. Yeah, but it's actually quite good. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you just can't help but think, my goodness, the, the, our, no, people's salaries are not in commensurate to the rise of food. Uh, and at the time, there were uh, uh, riots breaking out in Haiti and, and in Egypt and, and elsewhere around the world. And it dawned on me that my neighbors uh, around me in Indonesia were also not able to afford meat and things. And it really, everything sort of coalesced and, and, and gelled together of going, there is truly a, 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 a difficult period of time that we're having, a, lack of a better way of putting a food crisis. And it connects to a number of things. Um, rise of commodity prices, which are connected to where food uh, has left going into our stomachs and has been diverted into alternative fuels. 
uh, or where food goes into our stomachs and, and is going into the stomachs of animals to feed an enormous rise in, in eating of meat. Uh, it, it deals with pollution and, and using up our water that, that we're running out of on our planet. And, uh, and, and so it was key for me to, to find the politics of the food crisis. And uh, so when I looked at the story, I looked at it on a, very, on a global level and pinpointed it on, on nine countries in, in every continent uh, of the world. And, uh, and Egypt stood out before I went there as being a pivotal part of, uh, of, of the, the rise of food. And sure enough, when I got there, I was only there for three days, and it, it was just everywhere. Uh, the people every day, three times a day, fight to get the most basic commodity, and the most cheapest commodity, and that is government-subsidized bread, because they can't afford to eat. And, uh, and, and or, you know, already you knew that this was a political, political hotbed. And when you look at what happened two years later uh, with the, 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 the vegetable salesman in, in Tunisia, uh, it, it, people, there's been some great editorials, if, if you read them, uh, recent, uh, looking back at the Arab Spring. And, and it wasn't necessarily what Mubarak was doing, although the very, very awful brutal regime that he had. But it, was the, it, it spawned from the beginnings of the pe of people of Egypt being unable to feed themselves, and enough is enough. Yeah. So it, it, and so when we looked at this story for the geographic, we looked at it for, you know, hunger where it's off the off the shelf Ethiopia, where, where you've just fallen and you you can't go anywhere. Or solutions and the Philippines of finding uh, different forms of rice, uh, South America for for guano off the coast of Peru. But when you look at the politics of food and the end result of what people what happens when you can't afford to eat, you have a revolution and you have starvation. Um, we'll go on, Lindsay, to do a slideshow of your work shortly. Um, but maybe just before we do that, Gary, um, you were saying earlier that this book represents the origins up to now of the agency. Mm. And you've just come from your AG. Are we OK, um, Flora, just for a couple more minutes? Yeah, OK. And um, that you've just come <coughs> from your AGM with, you have now 23 photographers. So it's very much a new era yeah. that, that comes out. And, and it's nice that the book is, is looking back and, and now you're looking forward. Um, have you got anything that you'd like to share with us about what this future might be? And, and the yeah. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope it's a lot easier than the last two years, <laughs> I can say that. I think, um, I, you know, I think this book really does punctuate you know, the agency um, very, very nicely. And, um, you know, it's, it's probably the last project that, that you know, a lot of the founders will do pretty much by themselves, the owners will do by themselves. It's a very thoughtful book. Most of our books have been, they're thoughtful, but they've been done very rapidly. You know, they're pretty militant, most of our previous books. They're a response to uh, a political environment or something that's going on. So this is, you know, much more considered. It's taken a long time. Um, now the agency has grown. It's, it's doubled in size. We, we, uh, we don't all have gray hair uh, and trouble <laughs> getting up the stairs. You know, the new guys don't wake up at two in the morning to go to the bathroom. So we've got great hope, you know, that we've got a lot more energy in the agency. And a very, very different vision. Um, you know, a different view of the world. Um, these are photographers from a different time who come from really a very different culture um, and from, you know, very diverse, more diverse backgrounds. So, you know, I think the future in journalism and the future in photojournalism is, is really very exciting and very, very rosy. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to take... The agency started as a reaction to some great changes, and I think, you know, it's now evolved into a new space, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, create, uh, you know, some space for ourselves in this new environment and thrive. Okay. Um, shall we... Yeah. Should we get so, down here? Because we've got too much. No, it's alright. Sticking no, up we don't here have to screen. We don't have to I'll move out of your way a bit. Um, you guys do you Are we showing this all? Do you want us to. Just, just. Leave as Lindsay can't. isolated. No, 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 stay here. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, hey. sit up here. <laughs> don't move. Don't run away, John. It's no, I thought we needed to move because we got bobbleheads <laughs> in the window. If we, yeah, if, yeah, just maybe make a tiny bit of space. Lindsay, you could maybe come a little bit closer to me. Can you hit the light on the left-hand side, the, yeah. on the we're, side of the we're screen? We're lighting the screen. Yes, there we are. Is that, is that OK? Yes. Great. So it's great that we've got Lindsay here, because she can talk to us a little bit more about actually what it's like working for Seven and, and some of the assignments that she's done. 
And let's start off by talking about some of the work that we're seeing here now, Lindsay. Um, we, well, in fact, you've got one project that, that you told me about earlier of women in Afghanistan, which is an incredible two-year <laughs> project for National Geo, um, which is part of the work that I think we're going to see in this slideshow. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what that work was about and your experiences sure. covering it? I mean, I can also just say, um, so when I started photographing, the founding members of Seven were really the photographers that I aspired to be. I really looked up to their work, and for me, it's quite an honor to be part of an agency with them. Um, so the, the work that I'm showing tonight is sort of just a few pictures from uh, several different stories that I've done over the last few years. Um, dating probably back to Darfur in 2004. Um, I did a story on women in Afghanistan in 2009 and 2010 for National Geographic, and it was really the culmination of um, 10 years covering women in Afghanistan. I started going when it was under the Taliban uh, in 2000 and made three trips under the Taliban before it fell, um, before they fell, and have been covering women since then. So when Geographic assigned me to shoot women there, it was really uh, exciting and very difficult because photographing women in Afghanistan is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done because you don't only need permission from the women, but you need permission from their husbands and their fathers and their brothers, and you need to make sure that you get that permission because if you don't, that woman can be killed. So. Um, so there's that. There's this story about uh, maternal mortality in Sierra Leone, where uh, <coughs> they did until recently have the highest rate of women dying in childbirth. Uh, and I went there, and on the second day I was there, a woman bled to death in front of me. And it is a horrible feeling as a journalist to not have the tools to save someone and to not to just sit there and bear witness without being able to do anything. I was in a room full of midwives who were allegedly trained who I kept asking, isn't she bleeding too much? And they kept saying, no, she's fine. And they were laughing and sort of just mopping up the blood as she died in front of us. And so there are, um, <clears throat> and this is, these are some pictures from Libya. Yeah, it's, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? We don't have to keep watching. Um, I mean, it's interesting that, that at least a couple of these stories are about women's issues, um, and obviously, you're one of, you know, it's still the, you're still in the minority, I guess, as a, as a female photojournalist. It's great, but I know there are there are at least two or three more in in seven. Um, the fact that you're shooting these women's issues is is that something that you're particularly drawn to? I've never, um, I've never felt like I'm a very good combat photographer. I think I actually, um, I've always been drawn to the issues surrounding war, the issues that sort of lay on the margins of war and the repercussions of war. But when it comes to covering combat, I think I'm actually horrible. <laughs> I sort of am the first one down, face down in the dirt, just hoping that I don't get <laughs> shot. But I do think that it's important to cover, um, as a woman, and as a woman, um, one of not that many who do go to the front line and to war, I think it's important to cover women's issues. I have an access, especially in the Muslim world, that a lot of men don't have. Um, and I grew up in a family with three sisters, so we're four sisters, and I've always been interested in women and women's issues. Yeah. And we were talking earlier about that sort of classic question that you must get asked all the time, but it is genuinely interesting what is it like to be one of the few women working in a predominantly male world, what's it like when you're kind of working with a group of male photographers in a conflict, conflict zone, um, compared to something like the National Geographic story that is something you followed for two years. I mean, John, John knows when you work for Geographic, it's just lonely. You're, you're in the <laughs> field for very long stretches, and you often don't speak to anyone but your translator and driver and the people you're interviewing and photographing. But in a, in a war, as we all know, um, there tends to be a sort of a pack of journalists and photographers who cover the front line and the fighting. And, and I do wish there were more women. Um, you know, I often sort of miss seeing a woman around. And I was surprised in Libya there were actually quite a few women up on the front line. And that was 
um, you know, as dangerous it, as it was, it was also exciting for me to see a lot of young women up there because it is something that you don't see that often. Um, and I think there are many reasons for that. We can go into that, but I do think there there are reasons. I think it's um, physically. Are... I think it's physically grueling. I think it's it is it it is emotionally. Uh, it takes a toll and physically. And I think at some point um, we have a timeline men don't have in terms of having children. Um, I recently had a child, and I think a lot of women um, either make a decision to be a war correspondent or to have a family, and it's very hard to cross that boundary to have both. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are many incredibly talented female photojournalists working more on long-term assignments or personal projects or reportage. It's, it's the front line um, that, that you're in, in the minority, but John mentioned earlier the kind of emotional um, fallout from um, from covering the tsunami, and do you feel that there's a difference there? Do you feel that you're more or less susceptible to? I think we're all the same. I think if you're a sensitive person, you're you're exposed to some pretty miserable, horrible things that we witness in the field. And I think if you're a sensitive person, whether you're a man or a woman, you're going to be affected by that. We all internalize things very differently. Um, and we all move forward very differently. After, in last March, I was kidnapped in Libya, and I remember when I went back to New York, everyone was sort of like, are you, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I think I'm fine, actually. I think I'm okay. <laughs> like, weirdly, I'm not, you know, I, I think I'm okay. And I think that everyone's different. You know, maybe someone who had gone through that experience would have come out of it very differently. I, I don't, and I think that we all, it doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman, I think we all process things very differently. Gary, you're nodding over there, and, and John as well, having been sort of, can I say the old school of... of no, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> you may not. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you can if you want. This sort of revered. <laughs> no, I mean, sort of taking this in a slightly different direction, but I think it must be interesting for the younger generation of photographers and and do you do you feel protective of them? Are you? I mean, of what? What's your question? Sir? <laughs> the younger photographers. Of the, the young, of the young. Just talking about the the, the emotional fallout of covering um, conflicts. I mean, I, I, a lot of my you know, younger friends, they're the, the kinds of conversations you generally have with them, or in my case, anyway, in my experience, is about that rather than you know about cameras or. Photography. It's it's a it's about you know, it's about thinking stories through. You know how you know, a lot of conversations about the process of, of photographing and you know, dealing with it emotionally afterwards. For sure, there's a, many conversations about that. Um, so yeah, and I, but in terms of you know the, the gender difference, I, I think um, too much can be made of that. I mean, if you look yeah. inside this agency, you look, you know, starting with Alexandra, you know, Stephanie, Lindsay, you look at that coverage of war, Anastasia now, you know, that's, uh, they're out there and they're doing it and um, they're doing it very, very well. Yeah. And, you know, they have, the women in the agency have access to some very different stories to us, but, um, you know, Qualitatively, there is no difference, and they're right there, right where it is. Um, so, you know, I think one of the wonderful things in my career, in, over the course of my career, is that you know you see many, many more women photographing. I think one of the problems is you don't have many different um, ethnicities photographing. That's a whole different story, but that's a very significant issue that we've been discussing recently. Um, but. You know, Different people are now taking pictures. A lot of women and a lot of indigenous photographers, which is a, mm. a great leap forward. Yeah. You know, photographers in India, photographers in Latin America have more access um, to an audience. So they're the big changes. Okay. Um, shall we throw it open to some questions? Oh, we've got a, a slideshow. Got a slideshow? Yeah. Another one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to move? Well, no, you're not in the frame. Okay. Am I low enough? Yeah. I haven't even seen this. Okay. 
if you guys have any questions afterwards about any of these pictures, there, there are many more photographers from Seven who are responsible for these pictures than there are on the stage. Um, so you know, do dive in. Literally. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Scripted this, really. We've been rehearsing this for days, man. All we've been doing at the AGM is rehearsing this, in fact. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, first time Such I've ever a seen that like that. Wow. Actually, looking at um, a slideshow yeah. than the book, it's very, yeah, very, very different. Yeah. So buy the book. Yeah. Well, actually, the book on sale here, published by Fiden, um, signed, I think. Absolutely, yeah. We yeah. just spent hours downstairs <laughs> signing. <laughs> So who's for, got any questions? Thanks for putting that together, whoever did. It was very interesting to see it that way. So, yes, questions. I haven't um, seen it in this slideshow. Nick did. Oh, Nick. Right. Thank yeah. you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're only connected to the very much you know, the process of putting your own material together when you do these big group things from all over the planet. Yeah. So who's going to ask the yeah, first question? Yeah, fantastic question. questions. Um, as Gary said, there are other photographers from Seven in the audience. Um, Scotty. <laughs> How do you see the agency from formation the way that it came together? I think I'm loud enough. Um, uh, how do you see when the agency came together and how you formed and questions without answers, where you are now? Is it different to what you imagine? Is it how you what you expected? I suppose yeah. a very subjective, you know, yeah. question. But you know, what is seven now, and what was seven then, and what could seven be ten years time? That's a big question, man. I, I mean, it was really chaotic. You can answer over whiskey. Yeah, <laughs> it was really chaotic from my perspective in the beginning, uh, and. You know, I had no expectations at all that it would survive. It was really an experiment. And, um, you know, I think if I, if I knew now, you know, knew then what I knew now, I would never have done it, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a massive amount of work, and it was, it was really managing chaos. And that was just the structure, you know. And we were, this, all this was happening in the context of, two wars, you know, Afghanistan first and Iraq, and then all the other things that we cover, you know, Israel, etc. So it was, it was a, a pretty mad ride. Um, but it has evolved and it has more structure. And I think now, I think early on there was no question that, um, you know, the photographers overwhelmed the agency, overpowered the agency in every respect. But I think now, um, the agency is actually bigger than the sum of its parts. Uh, it's much, much more organized um, and much more focused. And that's one of the challenges over the last two, two, 10 years has been to try and, you know, put some structure and some focus into the agency. Um, so, you know, when we started, we, you know, we, I mean, we launched in Perpignan two days before 9-11. So, you know, everybody in the agency was on a plane and, and, and photographing that story and its aftermath pretty much as soon as we it started. It was like being shot out of a circus cannon. It's like, God, oh, let's yeah. get together, let's start an agency, well, let's plan all this out, let's get an office. Yeah. And we all got on planes and then boom, September 11th happened. You know, wrangling money out of people to launch the agency whilst we were launching it from ATM machines in Perpignan, <coughs> stuff like this, you know, it's pretty... They hung me upside down under a tree and beat the coins out of my yeah. pocket because I didn't have much money. Yeah. And seven years ago, we met in this room during an annual meeting. And if, you were to look, if I were to look back seven years ago to now, I would never imagine yeah. things would have evolved. So where to evolve in 10 years? I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Yeah. I think, you know, the industry that we're in is so wildly different now uh, to where it was even then. And we knew it was changing very rapidly then. We had no idea where it was going, but we, we felt the change, you know? Well, that's why they put it together, because the industry was changing. You didn't yeah. need a traditional agency, you know, late 90s, 2000. You could see the change was coming. Yeah. You were the guys that sort of kick-start that change as well, though, weren't you? you yeah, were, well, we realized... But, you know, we don't want that. We want yes. So we empowered yeah. ourselves and decided how we wanted to have our work represented and handled. Yeah. I, mean, I think you know, somebody described it at the time as the lunatics taking over the asylum. And I think to a large degree it was. We weren't entirely lunatic. You know, we, 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 sort of, we had a vision. Um, but you know, Magnum did this many, many years before, of course, and, and other agencies have you know, repeated that in the intervening period. But at that time, you know, we were being consumed by these 
large, large agencies owned by very, very wealthy uh, people. Um, and it was a pretty scary environment. And, uh, and I, you know, we swam in a different direction and we were very fortunate and it worked. Now the challenge, of course, is building something that will, you know, last and that will perhaps give us a legacy and, you know, survive for the next 20, 30, 40 years, grow, grow, grow way beyond us. Uh, and that is, a, is a, actually a much more difficult challenge than starting the agency in the first place. We were so naive in the beginning, as I said, you know, it, uh, we, if we knew then what we knew now, we might not have done it. And I, and I think now the challenge is, is really figuring out how to, how to adapt to, to this new future and what kind of structure you need to build. Um, and that's, that's very, very difficult. <coughs> yeah, very, very difficult. Hi. Hi. You're right here. You don't need a mic. Excellent for it. shoes and socks, <laughs> yeah, by the great, way. Great, great <laughs> scarf and tie. Robert, you'll be watching <laughs> glasses. <laughs> Hi. Can we change clothes? Um, my name is uh, <laughs> Bill, Bill Richardson. I'm from City University. I'm really interested in the way you've uh, built up the agency and the result being in this book. When you decide in both destination and location, do you collectively do some form of risk assessment, or is that left to you guys individually to decide where you'll go and, go and the chances that you'll take? And do you ever say no? That's yeah, individual. It's totally individual. It's totally individual. And yeah, numerous times you say no. <laughs> Everything's individual. You know. I mean, now that I have a family, I, I, I avoid conflicts to the highest level possible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I look on the peripherals that lead to conflict, I think everybody makes the assessment for themselves. You know, absolutely. And you know, many of us have a lot of experience of these kinds of stories. Many of us have had training. Which, if there's anybody here from your university who's in their early twenties or late teens, I would urge they do that. Um, but you know, yes, of course, you 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 know, just get on a plane and parachute into some chaos. Uh, you know, it's done very thoughtfully. Um, and extraction is is a, is the name of the game. You know. Um, but we don't do that collectively. We don't decide how to go and cover a story, you know, the, the war in Iraq. It's not like we sit around a table and figure out, oh, you know, Christopher will go here and Ron here, etc. cetera. Um, everybody goes wherever they want to go. They produce their own work. Um, you know, we don't work for seven. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're out there doing our own thing. And um, it's, it's very independent, which is the way I think it should be. I think Robert had a question. Gary, you said uh, early on something about the future being rosy. Yeah. Can you, uh, delineate that a little more? <laughs> God, that's such a big conversation, you know. That's, when, I, he, that's when he wears his sunglasses. The rosy sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, d I, don't, I don't know the answers, but um, you know, what I feel is this, is you know, when you and I started our careers, when we were represented by Marcel, um, putting film in envelopes, you know, shipping it from the other side of the world to New York or Paris, maybe not seeing the pictures for a year, having no relationship with the magazines, the clients we were working for. Uh, it was a very different environment. Felt pretty safe because it hadn't changed for years. We've been through <coughs> a big change. It's pretty scary, you know. A lot of people have, have suffered economically because of that, and that's normal in these kinds of transitions. But the situation we're in now is that, you know, um, we have a direct connection to the marketplace, however you determine that marketplace is, whatever you determine that marketplace is, whether it's clients, media clients, the public, NGOs, foundations, festivals, Lord knows who, corporations. Um, I think, you know, now we can, um, we have our own personalities, we can build our own space. Um, we are no longer, um, you know, fairly anonymous. Uh, practitioners out there in the field shoving film in envelopes and sending it off and not seeing it again. You know, we can connect. We have a, a live audience. And I think um, you know, with the iPhone, everybody in here, I'm sure, is taking pictures with iPhones, is consuming photography, using photography all the time. People are much more familiar with that visual language. People are more interested in it. There's a greater conversation about photography. And we are photographers, so it's a, it's a great place to be in. Uh, so I think, you know, we're, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting space. If you're working in, a, in an old way, I think you're going to struggle. 
I think if you're adaptive and you're able to evolve, if you're able to collaborate with others, look at the media as partners, you know, rather than um, as, you know, a bank, um, collaborate with all kinds of different people in all walks of life. I think it's a great space to be in, but it takes a lot of energy. You're not convinced, but in the bar, <laughs> I, I will. I mean, the economic model doesn't always follow easily, as you, as you all know. No. It's shifting to the new paradigm that we're working in now. Sure, I think, but I think you need to after, use... After the assignment there, so forth. You look at Christopher, he goes off, works in the White House, yeah. um, assignments for Time magazine. It's pretty, it's about as standard and old-fashioned as you can get, right? It's been going on for years. So Christopher uses the opportunity to completely redefine how political figures are photographed. He goes off and starts making films. <coughs> Out of that interest in film and that whole new style that he creates, he moves into the fashion world and he's built an entirely new career and reinvented himself. That's pretty interesting. I think that would be very hard to do 20 years ago. So, you know, I think now, you certainly at the agency, and I think it's possible for a lot of people, it's possible for anyone, you can, you can really change who you are. You know, I don't think we're constrained in the way that we used to be by the industry, and I think that's a magic thing, but it does take time to adapt. Um, hi, Pauline Mason. I actually work for a broadcaster. Um, as opposed to uh, a different side. Which broadcaster? Uh, <laughs> the BBC. Um, a, a debate that's going on at the moment, uh, you mentioned indigenous uh, coverage, and it's something uh, that I have been dealing with. I've just come back from a tour of Asia. Uh, how do you think that process is going in terms of increasing the plurality of voices you actually get in photojournalism and broadcast journalism? Do you, are you hopeful and do you think it's important in terms of how we view these really important stories? Yeah, does anyone want to have a go at that? Yeah, I think it's really important for people who, to photograph um, their own countries and, 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 um, and for more people to be in the market. It's a, it's a very expensive profession, so traditionally um, you know, only people with access to money or cameras have been able to do it. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's uh, nothing better for me than when I go to a country and you see a lot of people who have, have gotten one camera and they're out there and they're trying to cover something. And, you know, it's really, I was in Zimbabwe three weeks ago and, you know, there was a, a guy working for the AP, AFP and he came over and we were talking and, and you know, he's like, I've been working for the AFP and I said, look, there's a million things you can shoot here. And he said, well, I usually just shoot news and... You know, but and then we started talking about ideas and all the things that he could be doing in his own country, and he got really excited. And you know, I think a it's it's a money issue, b it's an information issue, and c there there aren't that many role models in a lot of these countries. So I think all of us have a real responsibility to to try and help people when we go out there, um, and and somehow to try and find a way to get cameras to people, or or at least you know, and some there, there is money out there, and and. There should be more people in the field, you know. A lot of what we do, we, at Seven, we created a, a mentorship program. And, uh, and this year, I'm uh, uh, mentoring a, a Bangladeshi photographer <coughs> in Nafis, incredibly talented. Uh, and I go back to the country that I lived in quite often, Indonesia. And I know Gary does this with his workshops. I do that with mine. I always sponsor a local photographer completely for free because I know these things are expensive. And, uh, and and you try and gosh the last workshop you came to Bali it's with me five years ago um, we had two 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 or three local photographers both of them went on to work for one for EPA and one staff uh, for AP and you, you 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 try to do what you can because as you're saying there's the economics the distance it's not easy for somebody from Jakarta or Beijing or Dhaka to uh, to jump on a plane and come see editors in New York or in London. Um, but by and by, you see, you know, you do see talent rising and with their own voices in their own countries. Yeah, it's, it's critically important for all of us that you know, we hear indigenous voices. I think Asia is actually a success story by and large, and somewhere like India, where two decades ago, the sort of three or four photographers who we all know from, uh, you know, been working in India for a long time, had means. They had the means of production. Yeah. You know? 
They were very wealthy, they were connected. Now you go to India and there are you know, dozens of Indian photographers from you know, more social classes, not all social classes, but more. Uh, and that's very important. I mean, there are still some you know, disaster areas, and I would say, I would categorize Africa as one where there is really the means of production doesn't exist, and then uh, places to publish. And that's a real problem, and you know, no education either. So you know, this is really critical. But I'm also seeing a lot of local photographers in Asia, and Africa, South America, uh, that are leveraging social media uh, and, yeah. and, and communicating that way. Uh, so the whole dynamics of how we communicate. You were asking, like, you know, the changes in our industry. It's, it's leveraging the, these alternative means and new means of communication. And sooner or later, there, there will be economic uh, balance. Let's hope. I mean, and it's happening at times. Yeah, a very different environment in that sense to you know, when the first photographs in this book were taken, that's for sure. It's moving in the right trajectory. Oh, why a book? Why revert to physical form when you can reach maybe a larger audience online and digitally? What? Oh. Well, there's a permanence in a book. You know, it's, uh, I still think people want to at least for me, I want to own something that I can put in my home. He's asking why, why do a book when everything's... I think you want to do everything, right? You know, the work's already out there. It's been out there for years, a lot of this work online. It's, it's really available and accessible, and it can be consumed you know, online and has been for years. And if you look at that slideshow, you know, you look at those photographs, you go and look at them in the book in context with text, you know, one after another. The book's very, very deliberately made. It's an object, you know, that is of, you know, has a great value in itself, but it's not a replacement for online or <coughs> film or any other you know, form of publication. But I don't think, you know, we should dismiss paper because it's been around for a long time. It's a marriage of our work yeah. together. It's none of us had seen this until what two days ago. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I was quite surprised with the book. I, I had this kind of preconceived thing that it was going to be this meddled mess and I wasn't going to like it. And uh, I was quite impressed with the, the marriage of our ideas and the visions that we carried through these last uh, 10 years, 20 years of our lives. Yeah. And, uh, and you I can think see it's a nice testament. You can't, you can't get that on a computer screen. You can't get that even on an iPad or on but a screen. All of these or, things are very, very different. You know, consuming pictures, consuming words, consuming film, consuming, you know, moving images on a television or a laptop isn't the same as in the theater. Why have theaters? It's a different experience. And I think, you know, that's what we're trying to extract from all of this work is as many experiences as we can. And so the act of publishing a book means that people will write about the book. You guys are here in the room because there's a book. So we can communicate with you. You might go off and talk to other people. Um, there'll be exhibitions. You know, it's just it's generating you know, more conversation around these ideas. And that's really, that's, that's one of the reasons. And all of this is available online or electronically. Just go to the Seven website. But here you've got it in a one contained unit. <laughs> That's our last question. Okay. Question down here. Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah. Mm. When you sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, when you approach these kind of themes about the women, um, well, I, it's a theme that I'm interested in too. Mm -hmm. So, how do you approach to the male that you need the permissions from? How do you approach to them? Because at the end, you are taking the theme for, you, you're going to make, oh, sorry, I don't know how to say it. Uh, what language you do you speak? Because you want to defend the woman's point of view. So what's the approach that you do for the males? In Afghanistan. To get the permissions. In yeah, Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. What's the, the approach that you give to them to explain them why you make I'm that story clear. when you are trying to defend I mean, I'm very clear. I say I photograph, I'm telling a story of the lives of women in Afghanistan, and I, and I want to document your wife or son or, or, or daughter for X reason. It depends what I'm doing. If it's a story on uh, maternal health in Afghanistan, um, you know, I explain that it has one of the highest rates in the world, and I and I think it's really important to show what's going on. If there's been progress, if it's education, it's talking about since the fall of the Taliban that women have access to education. 
Um, so I'm always very direct and very honest, and I explain the ways in which it'll be published because it's um, it's our responsibility as journalists and as photographers to explain how things will be published because people should know, um, especially in a country like Afghanistan where it can come back to them. When I first started working in Afghanistan in 2000, there was no media. Um, it was quite simple, actually. If you can actually get access to women under the Taliban, you can photograph as much as you wanted because it would never make it back there. And so women were quite open about being photographed. You know, I, I remember I was able to get into a women's hospital in Kabul and um, photography was illegal at the time. It was, you could photograph under the Taliban, but only inanimate objects. So I had permission to photograph buildings and rocks, basically. <laughs> and um, I went into a women's hospital and there were only women inside. And so I was able to photograph women and no one cared because there was no TV, there were no magazines, there was no press, there was nothing. So they were not worried about it coming back. Now it's very, very different. Every image you take, will probably make its way back to Afghanistan because there are TVs, there are media, things are, are copyright, the copyright doesn't exist. So if I publish something in the New York Times, it'll show up in the local Afghan newspaper with, you know, without credit. So you have to be honest. Hi, Jonathan Kruger. Um, I just wanted to sort of develop that and mm. ask if your attitude to Getting consent from your subjects have changed since you've been working? Since I've been working, since I started my career? No, not really. Um, generally, try and get consent from people. You know, it depends on the story, obviously. Um, if you're photographing people committing war crimes, you wouldn't. Um, and, you know, very often when you're working in the street, uh, it's, very, it's very, very difficult. Um, but I think. It depends on the nature of the story. If you're working around vulnerable people, um, then yeah, you need to, uh, they need to know what you're doing and, and acquiesce. The problem is with any kind of documentary photography, if you're going to do a story on a family or something, of course you go get permission and you kind of live with them and all that. You have permission. But if you're out doing any kind of documentary work, the once you stop somebody to ask, can I take your picture, there is no more picture you end up having to create something and it's not journalism, it's staged portraiture. So um, to stay true to journalism, you have to document. Maybe after you're done, you say, yeah. look, I've taken your picture for so-and-so. And, uh, but it's not like we're looking for model releases. I don't know. Yeah. We don't do it for commercial But purposes. I don't do it. I, if I'm in France shooting on the street, I don't look for model releases, nor in the States, nor anywhere. I, I, I wouldn't ask somebody to sign a model release. No, I would never. I don't care. But if I, but if I'm gonna, there's certain things I realize. Look, if I want to photograph, that's kind of an issue. You know, I, if there's a child. You know, I'm gonna have to kind of eventually suss up to the parents. Look, I work for so and so, and I just photographed your child. Is this okay with you? Yeah. yeah. We have uh, three or four other seven photographers here, sitting over here, all sheepishly hiding. <laughs> we, got, like, hiding. we have like 10 or 15, man. That's a whole bunch of us. But half the room actually is staff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seven photographers and staff. Any more questions? No. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, I'm just wondering, um, compared, say, to Alexia's photographers at Reuters, how do you think your work compares and would you ever do something like that, be an agency photographer? And uh, do, you, do you think there are pros and cons to being part of a collective or being quite independent? Good question. Well, wait a second, we are, we're still very independent. Yeah, we're just a bunch of people who come together as friends but is there, to, so to is there a The Reuters guys get pensions, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alexis greets them at the door every morning with orange juice. Yeah, juice. yeah. hot towels. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very different practice. You know, these guys, well, I, I don't know actually what Reuters photographers are all doing right now in this, these days, but, you know, a big component of what they do is go out and cover daily news, you know, and a lot of prescripted events, things that, you know, foreign minister's meeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they have to deliver that stuff for multiple deadlines as newspapers or, you know, deadlines close around the world. Uh, they're delivering images. So it's a, it's a very different world. They have people going out working on feature stories. 
which is very similar to a lot of the work that we produce. A lot of our so colleagues some work, we, yeah. we encounter, it's an overlap. Mm. The, mm. We call them the wire photographers, AP, Reuters, AFP. We're, we're friends with a lot of them. They just have a different product that they have to produce. There's a requirement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the main differences is that you work on assignment and we work on subscription. It's a well, well we don't always work on assignment, assignment either. either. Right. Sometimes we You have a steady working. job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a lot of the pictures in, in, in this book <laughs> will have been photographed with an AP or Reuters or AFP photographer, you know, very close by, probably riding yeah. in the car. Um, certainly that was the case with me in Iraq, and I know it's the yeah, case with, you know, Ron and John and, sure. and Chris over the years, so it's, you know, the, the hard thing is for them is they have to really worry about getting the picture out quickly. Yeah. They have to worry about different time zones, deadlines. Yeah, rolling deadlines. And they don't own their own work, which is probably the most significant difference. But they have a pension. <coughs> they have a pension, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I think also it. there's a, a, a wire photographer has to be able to shoot a soccer match at 7 o'clock at night and then get up and do a press conference and then get on a, you know, and uh, yes, as a photographer, there's the kind of, s the security, you might say. Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, it's much more of a kind of rolling rotation of bang, 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 and go here and go there. But I think that the agency, and Reuters definitely um, try to more and more um, add a bit of depth to that coverage as well. Yeah. Um, and we're not, you know, the, the, the agency pho photographers will get a list of things to photograph during the day or they'll get assignments, right? They get a call, go off and do this. Lindsay, didn't you work for, were you with AP? I was with AP, well, yeah, yeah, in the yeah, late 90s. Late, yeah. yeah, that's how I started and that's how I learned. I mean, yeah. to me it was the best training because I didn't ever study photography. So I just showed up in New York and said, I want to be a photographer. <laughs> and I had a great mentor at the AP, and I just took any assignment they would give me for three years. And, and I had, you know, that's, that was So your captions training. and keywording are oh, quite yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm pretty good. You were, you, were, you were trained by the AP. So, yeah. That's a real uh, mm. issue at seven. Some of us aren't the best in uh, captioning. But you have to make a picture out of nothing. I mean, you have to really, you have to show up at a press conference and make it interesting. And if you don't, there are 55 other freelancers standing behind you who will, so. Plus the wires are in a real different, there's a lot of pressure on them because <coughs> if, if AP's there, Reuters there. If Reuters there, there's AFP there. And they're photographing pretty much the same subject. And their bosses get this daily report. I forget what it's called. The yeah, where it gets placed. The, pla get the, the play. play report, the, right? the play report. <laughs> and it's like if the Reuters has 10 front pages and AP <laughs> doesn't have any, the photographer gets a call and says, well, why, why did you do this, you know? I but mean, a real prime example is when the, the photographers went to Iraq. When, when Bush went to Iraq and the, the guy threw the shoes at him, you have the mm. three wire photographers there. Uh, Evan Vucci for AP, uh, I forget, there's Saul, Saul for uh, We had a local AFP. Iraqi guy. Yeah, but yeah. the problem is, and there's this whole thing for the poor wire photographers. I did a whole book on covering the presidents called My America. So I would go in the event, the president would be on the stage, I would leave. I'd go outside, I'd go around, take pictures, but they could never leave because if something happens to the president, they're out of the job. And sure enough, they come in, Kevin Lamarck from Reuters is trying to get position in the back of the room, and Evan Vucci's getting on the floor, and all of a sudden, whack, a shoe flies by, you know. <laughs> and uh, they look up, and uh, but nobody got a photograph no. of the shoe. Evan Vucci from AP got a frame of when he threw the second shoe, but it's of the guy throwing the shoe. And they almost fired him. <laughs> you know, he got... Jeez. Yeah, it's like, because well, you've got to have the camera on the president. You know, so no, they're, under, really they're under so much pressure. There was a... Charles Omini, the Newsweek photographer, we, if we were there, we would have been out having drinks. And <laughs> <laughs> we never would have seen it. So there's just a different pressure yeah. on the wire photographers. And anything they do, if they're at a demonstration, if they're, uh, yeah. if they're in Libya yeah. on that highway, they're under a lot of pressure. Yes. 
the competition is intense and, yeah. and the really good wire photographers, they kind of thrive on that. And if we miss it, nobody knows. Yeah. Right. You know, there's <laughs> no <laughs> real pressure, just amongst Thank ourselves. God. Yeah. Yeah. So, my hat's off to them. Go on, Angus. <laughs> yeah. Photographers can make it is that uh, Reuters and AP and AFP uh, employ an incredible number of, of yeah. local people, and it's always been the way, be they Thai or Salvadoran or Palestinian, and the good ones make it and go on for, yeah. to, to great careers. So yeah. in, in fact, actually, I'm... I'm I'm glad you brought that up. I, I kind of wanted to say that but as the moderator. Um, but actually, no, it's been really um, exciting for us to see, for example, um, our Afghani photographer who yeah. was a fixer and who is now the chief photographer in India. So not only was he running yeah. Afghanistan, he's now moving on mm -hmm. and he's training Indian guys. And, uh, and, and actually, I, I think that for us, definitely, that when there's been a conflict in the country, it's really a great, sadly, a great opportunity to find incredible local talent and move them up through the company and see them become really international standard photographers. Well, how many Bosnians are there in Reuters yeah. and AP, you know, yeah, all over yeah, the yeah, world exactly, now photographing yeah. stuff? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. You know, and and you know, Iraqis and yeah. Kashmir has produced a disproportionate number of, of photographers in India, probably more than in Delhi and, and Mumbai combined, you know, because of the story there and the need for um, the foreign agencies to have pictures. I have to remember, Angus, Apichat Virawang, you know, taught me how to print in, uh, he, was, he just thought my standards were hilarious in Bangkok. <laughs> Um, but these guys used to edit my pictures and, and taught me how to photograph and you know, show me what to do. So yeah, they're phenomenal. Are we going to end on a good positive Reuters? No. Yeah, <laughs> we love Reuters. <laughs> my we job is done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is that the program? I think. Is that it? <laughs> I think Flora, needed, Flora, did you want to? Um, yeah. There's some more questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See, Ron, that's not that. No, it's not a real question. It's just about the pictures. Um, I really hesitated um, clapping my hands because of, um, well, the things which were shown in the pictures. And, yep. uh, but anyway, I would really like to thank you for this book and for your work, for your approach to those who get the voice through your pictures. I have the book since a few weeks already and I'm really happy about that. And um, it takes time to make those pictures and it takes time to have a look on those pictures. So, well, even the book is very, very important to have. And uh, thank you for your work. This is just my personal statement. Yeah. I'm Thank not you. somebody Thank official. You know, so. I, I would like to add one thing here. You know, um, Fiden spent I, what three years, maybe four years, working with us to make this book. This was a monumental effort by them. It's quite painful for them. I, I think. think it was. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them left and went to New York. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But I, joking apart, you know, they, they have invested an awful lot of time. They've reprinted this book because it, 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 you know, the first printing didn't work. The glue moved, I think. They've you know, made an incredible effort to produce this book. And we haven't really spoken about them. And I think, you know, Fiden's commitment to publishing photographic books is extraordinary. And I think the value of this book, as this gentleman alluded to, is one thing looking at these pictures on the screen, they pass by a few seconds, you know, you look at them on your laptop, you disappear into Facebook. You know, sit down with this book. It is a monumental book. It's a, it was a monumental effort by them. And go through it slowly. Take a year. But it is a different way of, of looking at the pictures. They're all in context. There are stories with them and, and captions with them. And it's a very, very different experience. And I think for the photographers, this is probably represents the best way for you to look at our work. So I would actually, if there's anyone left here from Fiden, I would like to thank Fiden for sticking with us. Most of our books were made in three months, two months. This one you know, it was a struggle, but it was worth it.
So thanks, Fiden. Plus they had to carry him up the stairs. God damn, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> Thanks, guys. Why don't you get some beers, buy some yeah. beers. Get lots of beers, buy lots of books. <laughs> Thank you, Claude.